perhaps the most fundamental change that's occurring is there's been a real shift from a kind of visionary driven government to a managerially oriented government. Uh, when Raul Castro took over as president of the country, he'd spent 40 years running the military and he was a management guy. And he looked at the problems in Cuba and focused on the management things that needed to be done, particularly improving the economy. And so this meant that many aspects of the society were changed, including laying off large numbers of government employees. And for a society that was very much committed to providing social care for people, this has created a considerable crisis. The question then is what has this done to the healthcare system? For 30 years, uh, Cuba has been a model for other nations, especially in the developing world, providing a healthcare system that was envied by many. It was characterized by its universality. Everybody had health care. It was accessible to everybody. It was comprehensive and it was cost-free cost at point of access. The most important point as far as other developing countries were concerned was that it was a system that was highly cost efficient for countries with limited resources. Cuba was not ever an affluent country so they had to make do with limited spending and this is what makes it so re relevant to other developing countries. It is characterized particularly by prevention and early detection. And that is done through primary, by community-based primary health care to lower the upstream costs for taking care of disease in its later stages. And this primary health care is supported by municipal hospitals in every significant community. And then at the national level, a series of specialty hospitals uh, for things like uh, cardiac surgery for children, uh, special cancer hospitals. There are also 14 institutes in Cuba for conducting research and specialized clinical care. This includes basic science like the Institute of Immunology, and also the Child Cancer Institute. There are 25 medical schools in Cuba, at least two in each of the 19 provinces in the country, um, nine provinces in the country. If you want to go to medical school and you live in Oriente province, you have to go to medical school in one of the medical schools in your own province. That is because they don't want everybody gravitating to Havana. They want you, if you're from Oriente, to go to medical school in Oriente and stay there and practice medicine in Oriente. Um, they have one school, the Latin American Medical School, which is the largest medical school in the world with an enrollment of 12,000 students and they come from all over Latin America, all over this hemisphere, including at the moment about 100 US students going to medical school in, at the Latin America Medical School. Uh, there are in Cuba roughly 36 to 37,000 family doctors and there are family doctors distributed throughout the country, even in the remotest areas. Each doctor is responsible for 375 families, which is roughly 1,500 individuals, and each family doctor, group of family doctors, is supported by a polyclinic, and that polyclinic is a central facility that includes all of the major specialties, a dentist, and psychologists and nutrition, nutrition experts. One of the key aspects of the Cuban healthcare system is that it's very much results driven. There is enormous emphasis on data collection, epidemiology, uh, and uh, health mapping. And health mapping is something that the Cubans got into very early and 
is a very important aspect about how good health is maintained. Uh, all birth weights, all births by weight are plotted on maps. And you can look at a city in Cuba and you can see that if you go just two blocks, you have lower birth weight babies. And that immediately says to you, why is that? What is, what is it about this six block area that the women there have smaller babies? And you go then and, and look. And they've done the same things for diabetes. They plot all cases of diabetes. And it turns out that you know, it clusters too. And you can find out why people living in a certain area get diabetes, why people in another area don't. This obviously is particularly important for environmental health issues, but it turns out that other things that you wouldn't think were much connected to the environment really are. The environment has a profound effect on people's health. Now, the outcome measures in Cuba, at the moment, Cuba has an infant mortality rate of 4.83. That compares with six for the US, in Washington, D.C., infant mortality is 8. In Detroit, it's 12.8. Richmond, Virginia, 13.50. And Mississippi, uh, which is probably statewide the worst in the U.S., it's 10 or a little more than double what the infant mortality rate in Cuba is. Uh, life expectancy is 78, which is the same as the U.S. And uh, that's good, but it's not as good as Japan or Australia or some other advanced countries. HIV infection is one of the very lowest in the world and certainly in this hemisphere, and it's 0.02%. In the U.S. it's 060 Norway 0.10%. One of the other things which makes a big difference to child health in Cuba is there is absolute universal vaccination. You can't grow up in Cuba and not get basic immunization against all childhood diseases. Because uh, the, uh, the Cuban healthcare system has recently been described by Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization, who said Cuba's approach Give the world, gives the world a model for transforming health systems towards the noble goals of equity and social justice, illustrating well that societies that have the least inequality have the best health outcomes, regardless of the spending on health. And I think that the last phrase is extremely important. Uh, the Spending on health care per capita in the U.S. is by far the highest in the world, and yet the health care system is ranked by WHO as 37th in the world. And there has to be some reason other than money why 36 other countries have a better health care system than the U.S. Now, you build a health care system to take care of the health problems that you have in society. But what we often forget is that the health problems are not static either. They're changing all the time and can make your health care system irrelevant to what they're now supposed to treat because it isn't what it was set up to treat 50 years ago. The most significant thing that's happening in Cuba is an aging population as the diseases, infectious diseases and other diseases have been dealt with, people are living longer and you have more and more a geriatric population for a health system to take care of and it has to adapt to that. An added problem to that is that taking care of the diseases of the, the geriatric population is very expensive. It's expensive in that it requires usually drugs that people have to take every single day for the rest of their lives, like anti-diabetic drugs, anti-hypertensive drugs. And also, uh, these are diseases that by and large are not going to get cured at any point. So continuing physician care is also essential. So it becomes very expensive. 
Uh, for Cuba, the increased cost of health care has been compounded by several really bad hurricanes that have hit Cuba in recent years. Uh, we know about Katrina, but there were comparable hurricanes in Cuba that did enormous damage, 10 billion in damage. And in a country with an economy, just a fraction of that in the US, this was devastating. The other difficulty in Cuba is that, like any bureaucracy, the management was it, it os has ossified over the years, has become less and less effective. Like most bureaucracies, it became more self-serving and that created a real problem for Cuba. Um, the new commitment to better management generally in the country and laying off significant numbers of government employees has also hit the healthcare system. And so the decision was made uh, to reorganize the management uh, in order to make sure that the quality of care and the patient focus of the system uh, was not damaged while making the delivery of services more efficient. There have been two major studies in, uh, in Cuba to address this. One was entitled Necessary Transformations in the Public Health System and it looked at what could be done over a two-year period of time this study was conducted to really reorganize and consolidate a lot of the healthcare system. Um, for some rather interesting reasons, when the revolution happened in 1959, there was some question about whether Cuba shouldn't get rid of its one medical school that it had then and move to um, non-physician healthcare. Um, but there was a decision to do the opposite because they felt people would say the revolution, before the revolution we had doctors to take care of us. The revolution is giving us second-rate care. They are going to treat us with people who are not doctors. So the decision was made not only to keep doctors but to expand it and make doctor care available to everybody. I'm not sure from a purely medical standpoint or from an economic standpoint that was always the right decision, but it certainly was a political decision that they felt they had to make. So it is a very doctor-centered system. There are, for instance, no midwives in Cuba. Uh, all deliveries are done by obstetricians. Um, and that is very successful. It's part of the reason they have a very low infant mortality rate, but it's probably not terribly cost effective and not terribly useful as a thing they can export to the rest of the world. Um, the second study they did was how to um, implement the objectives that they uh, uh, recommended in the first study. And this particularly emphasized addressing patient complaints. Um, they were worried that in all this reorganization, the needs of the patients would be lost and not focused on. So they didn't want to lose that. And so they have specifically mandated addressing patient complaints. Um, internationally, they've had to cut back, although they've tried to do that in only a limited way. Currently, there are 16,000 doctors in 66 countries. Uh, they want to maintain the commitment, but they're asking the recipient countries to bear more of the financial burden. The Latin American Medical School will continue unchanged, including the 500 scholarships they have given to U.S. students. But again, they're asking them to share the cost. The biopharmaceutical industry has been significantly expanded and they now produce 67% of all of the domestic pharmaceutical needs they have as well as all of, all of these other products which they're exporting and it produces revenues of a billion dollars a year uh, for Cuba and it's second only to nickel as an expert product. Um, if you want more information about this, my organization publishes the only English language peer-reviewed journal on the Cuban healthcare system and there are copies of that journal there. There are also uh, a pamphlet about the organization 
uh, and one of some of our projects to introduce the Cuban healthcare system in various underserved communities in the US. Or you can go on the web, the organization's web is medic.org, the journal is there, and my personal website that has other information on it is at the bottom. Thank you very much.